Welcome to Matrix Network's YouTube channel. Uh, if you've stumbled across our page, you're probably a technology enthusiast, just like we are here at Matrix. What we do is deliver exceptional client experiences through innovative solutions made simple. We don't offer everything underneath the sun. We offer three key areas of business technology. Number one, internet optimization. Number two, data infrastructure, deployment, management, and long-time support. And number three, cloud-based applications such as your phone system, contact center, and a host of other solutions that help your organization achieve their goals and optimize their business technology ecosystem. In this video, you will hear from Jeremy Ness, CTO of Matrix Networks, who is going to showcase typical challenges that we are seeing in the uh, business world these days, especially with organizations that have multiple locations and work from home employees. He's gonna wipe that down. He's gonna show you how our engineers come in and redesign uh, specific internet connectivity to optimize environments and help organizations achieve optimal performance. Buzzword, 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 but enjoy the show. Oh, and if you like this content, please subscribe down below. Cheers. All right, so um, this made a diagram of kind of any network that we find our, ourselves in. Um, of course, there is no you know real typical network uh, outside the commonalities. I mean, uh, you know, if you're multi-site, uh, you got to connect those in some fashion, assuming you still have resources that need to be consumed in a central spot. Um, if you're doing that over MPLS or uh, you know, ENS or EPLs, or there's a lot of you know connectivity options for uh, ease of diagramming. I went ahead and chose just a real traditional IPsec connectivity uh, for multi-site. So I'm going to start in this environment. Um, you'll head in, you know, kind of start at, at headquarters here, right? What do I typically see um, at headquarters? Or this might be a colo environment. More specifically, you know, where do I still see resources? Um, it is very rare. I walk into an environment today. That we walk in an environment and don't see something still on prem, right? It's always me, at least a domain controller and a file server and maybe a old ERP system that you can't turn off because uh, for compliance reasons, you need to access that stuff for 10 years. And um, anyway, there, there's always some kind of infrastructure, right? And, and typically it's a uh, some hypervisor solution and VMware, or vSphere or Hyper-V or uh, maybe a hyper-converged uh, solution, right? So. Um, have resources on-prem, uh, typically a, a pretty decent switching infrastructure. However, this is kind of the first area that, that we see uh, our, our clients having issues, uh, or not issues, but uh, challenges, right? Um, visibility into the LAN switching infrastructure can often be very missing if you don't have uh, flow information or something like that set up. Um, and I'm also just amazed how many people don't just have basic monitoring alerting, right? Hey, is a port flapping, as uh, a spanning tree uh, root change, right? Just kind of these basic you know, health of uh, at least our, our, our switching infrastructure. Um, as Kyle mentioned, it's also amazing how many non-POE switches I see out in the environment, right? At some point in time, someone tried to save a, a few bucks, uh, but now you're deploying cameras and phones, and all of a sudden you have to add an extra POE switch that only the phones can go into, and then the computers have to stay over here, and uh, whatever that looks like, right? Um, definitely a, a challenge we see pretty often. And then uh, when I move up out of the, the switching infrastructure, uh, and also, Kyle mentioned the wireless. Uh, it is also interesting that people did make the investment in PoE, but not uh, more modern PoE plus, right? So as we see these Wi-Fi 6 radios come out, a lot of these are very power hungry, need that 20 to 30 watts uh, of power, right? So, and again, the short-term solution, go grab one switch, put all the wireless on there. Uh, of course, if that switch fails, the, the wireless is down. And then move up to the firewalls, right? You know, in a headquarters or colo environment. Right, uh, often it's the HA, which is which is awesome, right? A highly available, highly available, uh, kind of active, passive, you know, firewall. Uh, and then moving out of the LAN, right? Um, everybody needs interconnectivity, right? That's just where we are um, in terms of you know consuming applications and, and, and information, right? So uh, very common again at headquarters to, to see uh, multiple circuits. Uh, as you see here, I did put a, a fire run a coax. Um, you know, we're big fans of, uh, you know, separate last mile mediums and separate last mile providers, right? Preferably your fire and your coax aren't from the same vendor. Uh, typically those are different last mile networks, but then when we peer with the, the broader internet, uh, internet peering, oftentimes those infrastructures are gonna meet somewhere down the road uh, to where if there are issues there, it still affects, um, you know, fire and coax or DSL or, or whatever, you know, physical mediums that these uh, carriers are, are, are delivering. Also, when we're talking about dual internet circuits at headquarters, right? Uh, we just have to tell our firewall how to use those things. 
So typically we do load balancing and active active. Um, but another area we you know see that that could potentially um, not be optimal is the fact that the firewall doesn't know how to use these circuits correctly. Uh, by that I mean if I have a Zoom call, one of these circuits is absolutely gonna be better for that Zoom call than the other, right? Uh, lower latency, jitter, packet loss. Uh, if I'm doing that dreaded Windows update uh, that Kyle talked about, um, right? One of these circuits is better for that. It doesn't care about you know latency or jitter or packet loss even, right? It's a big heavy TCP flow. Um, and what's bandwidth? So again, uh, firewalls just kind of lack the capability of knowing those metrics of the circuits, right? So you turn on active active and occasionally there's two users sitting next to each other. One has a problem on Zoom and the other one doesn't. And you probably know what the problem is, but you don't know which circuit it is. Uh, anyway, that's just a, a common challenge, especially as we're consuming much more video, uh, hosted voice, hosted you know, contact center. Um, probably the last thing I talk about uh, on the land switching side, at least, is uh, that segmentation piece, right? Uh, it's interesting how many times I walk into an environment and it's just one big happy VLAN one, right? That's just how it's been. Uh, you know, it's a pain to go re-IP things to do segmentation especially kind of static segmentation, right? Trying to do individual ports. Um, of course, for security, that becomes a big problem, right? Lateral movement becomes very trivial in an environment where there's just no segmentation. So we are starting to see a lot more adoption of uh, kind of those NACs or network access control that can do device polling uh, to try and create segmentation um, and put you know security or at least some boundaries uh, to kind of top that attack surface. Of course, the natural evolution is zero trust, which I will uh, touch on. Um, touch on next so um again headquarters probably you know uh just like any of your environments here some server infrastructure decent switching probably ha firewalls um this is typically also where the knowledge workers are at if you want to call them that right um like uh accounting and hr and often you know it ourselves and c-level um that are supporting everybody at, at the remote locations right so if we move out to our branches um again this could be retail this could be manufacturing um, you know, uh, I only drew one here on the diagram. This could easily be 10, 15, 20, 100, whatever that looks like. So uh, at these branches, can we typically see, you know, simpler infrastructure, right? Uh, typically a switch or two. Oftentimes we don't make the investment for highly available firewalls. Uh, oftentimes uh, we also don't make the investment in, in, in multiple circuits. Um, and then hit and miss, but, you know, definitely do see servers there. Um, but generally, when I see servers there, they're always due to the lack of the resiliency redundancy to the main applications that need to get, get at headquarters, right? Um, so we put some there so we can at least run POS transactions or, or uh, uh, whatever that looks like, right? But, you know, ideally, generally, we're still going to be consuming applications um, out of headquarters, right? So uh, if I'm doing internet here, of course, it's our good old friend, uh, the VPN tunnel, right? Our traditional IPsec. Uh, but here, kind of hit another challenge, right? I have multiple circuits at headquarters, but IPsec doesn't enable me to actually use those. So I have to choose to terminate this tunnel on one of these circuits, and you're just gonna assume the fiber is probably gonna be uh, on the par uh, better than a, than a coax circuit, right? Um, it is sometimes possible, because I know definitely times it's not, to try and build a backup IPsec tunnel and fail over to it in secondary um, circuit at headquarters. But again, um, that can definitely be a challenge and talk about that complexity uh, of that. So um, you're consuming uh, application at headquarters, uh, but as a whole in the industry, inevitable seemingly at this point, uh, our applications are slowly moving out, right? Um, kind of a few options there. Um, we can do the, the IaaS or, or public cloud, right? Infrastructure as a service. Um, I don't see honestly a lot of that. I mean, depending on your size and your vertical and all that. Um, but I mean, oftentimes it's a lift and shift, right? Hey, it's a VM on-prem and now it's a VM. So I don't have to worry about harder refresh and licensing is often easier and the availability is easier if I can do multiple availability zones in a, in a public cloud. But, or it's consuming just kind of cloud native paradigms, right? Being like Azure AD with this on-prem AD and um, using things like Intune or whatever to, to compensate for, for group policy and uh, you know, uh, MS SQL as a service and, and, and all these, right? Um, I'd say more than not, uh, we generally see more SaaS adoption, right? Hey, post on my moving my CRM or ERP virtual machine up to some other cloud, Azure AWS. If they provide that as a consumable resource, man, that's a lot easier for me. I don't have to 
patch the server, pay for the server, pay for the software. So I'd see in general, we see a lot more SaaS adoption, right? Um, that's across, again, a lot of kind of business lines of applications and the voice and the video and contact center and, and all these, right? So now the branch also needs access to those too, right? You know, we're gonna have some kind of on-prem uh, resources here and some maybe there and some there um, to where optimizing that can, can be a, a, a real pain, right? Um, we can do things like, hey, you know, we need to do the VPN here, but then we also, you know, need to do it there. Well, it's another challenge we often see is kind of the scalability of these firewalls, right? Um, a lot of these do kind of management planes, uh, you know, a, a Florida manager or panorama or something like that. But I'm also amazed how often those are not used or they're just so cumbersome or something not deployed or they're so cumbersome they're just not used. So I've walked into just countless 15, 20 site environments where, you know, the poor IT staff is maintaining 20 firewalls, um, right? And each new branch, you have to go in and set up the new IPsec tunnel. And uh, then of course you get the worst config drift, right? Uh, you try and do a quality service because you deploy a, uh, you know, a, a new application at the firewall to try and prioritize it over the started Windows update. But um, again, it just it doesn't scale real well, right? Um, and then lastly, uh, you know, the, the home and remote, right? Uh, of course, everyone wants to, you know, beat on this drum since the pandemic, uh, which don't worry, I will. But we've always had the road warriors, right? We've always had people outside our environment um, that we've always had trouble securing. That's just, that's been life in IT for the last, um, you know, I've been in it for, for 20 plus years now, right? Um, so what does this remote user, home user typically look like, right? Well, typically it's a company, company issued device, right? Uh, hopefully it has some kind of AV or EDR, uh, more modern, right? And point detection response or an XDR, which we need more acronyms, right? Can't have just uh, endpoint has to be extended. Um, anyway, some kind of, um, you know, agent on the endpoint, maybe an MDM agent. Um, to get some control, some visibility, right? And of course, during the pandemic, this was all, you know, hugely rushed. Uh, many of you probably had to go to Best Buy or Costco or anywhere and walk out with 20 laptops and slap your endpoint age on and slap a VPN client on it and, you know, send your end users on their way, right? So now we have our remote users. Uh, you know, what does that look like for, for their security and, and how they connect in the environment? Well, uh, again, they're going to have their, their VPN client and, Again, can I have this headquarters dilemma, right? Um, sure, any IT guys on here, you've probably had to deploy the Cisco AnyConnect client or NetExtender or Florida client or whatever. And you, know, you have the entry one says use this first and then the entry two, hey, if that didn't work, use this one. Um, again, not great, uh, but you know, well, we have to do what we have to do, right? Um, so um, when we do this VPN tunnel, typically we always do a split tunnel, right? I would do that for a few reasons. Um, so uh, I guess, does not uh, aware split tunnel says, hey, any traffic going to these servers, send over the VPN, but everything else just send out, right? Uh, again, we do that so um, that we don't have to do a full tunnel, right? A full tunnel makes us hairpin or trombone or whatever word you want to use, right? You have to go in and out of the, the firewall. This can also lead to a really poor end user experience if you're geographically geographically dispersed at all, right? Uh, if end users are on the, the West Coast and you're on the East Coast and you're forcing all the traffic across the country, all right, this is where this kind of peering issue comes in to where there's no way they're gonna stay on their carrier all the way, right? To where uh, oftentimes we see issues on last mile carrier network, but then also those peering connections can be especially an issue with saturation or uh, um, not optimal routing, right? Comcast is famous for this. They're an eyeballs network as we call it, right? Um, and they always wanna charge everybody to peer with them and they don't you know, do crazy stuff with BGP and, and, and don't, um, do a appropriate bandwidth to, to their peers oftentimes. So so we do a split tunnel, right? Hey, you know, yeah, the application performance or GPOs or file server might not be great, but at least, you know, as we've moved more SaaS and SaaS applications, at least those should be good experiences. You know, those are generally gonna be hosted uh, across the country. But again, if we're talking about security, right? Um, you know, yes, perimeter's dead and all these cliche things. But I mean, pre-pandemic we were, used to most of our end users being in the environment, right? We did have those road warriors and the exceptions. Um, but after, you know, everybody left the office, I just, you know, really tenfold. And what from we're hearing from our clients is we're gonna be hybrid forever. Um, and we actually have several clients that are just closing offices in mass. We had big projects started before to do switch refreshes or whatever. And uh, there's a particular ad agency here in Portland. They had eight sites coast to coast and they're closing them all down. They're letting the leases just run out. Hey, we learned we can just do this remote. Why have this expensive office lease, right? 
Um, and again, you have some endpoint detection, but uh, you still don't know what the end user is doing. You're not wrapping them in the, the anti-botnet, anti-phishing, uh, TLS decryption, um, you know, all, all, all that good stuff. And um, of course, I can make this more and more painful, right? I mean, say you know you did move some stuff to AWS, and again, you got to choose one of these circuits to do IPsec, or maybe do an express route or a, a direct connect, right? And the end user needs access resources in the public cloud, so uh, they're going to VPN here, and then they're going to go here. And um, the point is, it just doesn't scale well, right? Uh, managing multiple firewalls can be a pain. Um, doing VPNs all over the place can can be a pain. Um, you know, have to kind of make decisions about what circuit to use, uh, not optimal. Having the end users just really no visibility, uh, not optimal. But I say, Jeremy, you know, on all our branches, we do have the dual circuits, right? Because um, we know, yes, resilience and redundancy is, is important. And Jeremy, I mean, all of our firewalls have SD-WAN. I know what you're talking about, you know, link steering and active active and, and all that. Um, and that's great. Right, um, we're, we're big fans of this technology. Right, it lets me do that that multipathing thing and and multipathing thing and give me really robust connectivity to my on-premises servers. Right, um, but as mentioned, I mean we're just seeing more and more SaaS. Right, and there's no you know firewall in the sky, um, you know sitting next to your your favorite cloud service to 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 enable that. Right, um, and again, if you have an you know direct connect or whatever at the colo into your public cloud. Right, I still have to, you know, kind of backhaul all the way back, and um, you know. So yes, we love SD WAN, but we find that that a kind of point to point, uh, right? Uh, every firewall now generally enables that. Still, just doesn't help with this further progression of cloud services. And then, of course, you still got your poor end user here. Um, no matter how robust your site to site connectivity is, it's still just kind of hanging out there. Um, you know, uh, not secure. Uh, or not as scared as they should be, right? Falling in your, into your old policy. Um, and again, frankly, you know, accessing your apps can, can be a challenge. So here's where we see really a, a big push into uh, cloud delivered security, right? If everything we're consuming is in the cloud or most of it, um, that whole edge does just make less sense, right? We should be, you know, really pushing that security closer to our applications, right? We used to have this big envelope around our applications of security, right, when they're on on premises. Um, but as we kind of push out, um, push those out, that uh, becomes more of a challenge. As we try and scale, it becomes more of a challenge, right? As we have more branches and remote users and all that. So um, there are kind of steps between what I showed and 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 here, but this is really what we see everybody moving, right? It's sassy. I hate Gartner makes me think about the cat from Homeward Bound uh, every day. As I say, sassy over and over and over. But as Kyle alluded, this is that secure access service edge, right? Uh, the first place I like to start kind of describing what this looks like. I mean, it is cloud firewall, but it's always giving me that controller based, right? Uh, as I mentioned, uh, firewall infrastructure, LAN infrastructure switches, we we'll often see those all managed in a one off fashion, right? Uh, at least mistakes, config drift, patching is difficult. So we're rolling these into more controller-based solutions, dashboards, orchestrators, whatever fancy word you want to call them. Um, you know, really makes a ton of sense, right? So uh, I set my policy in one spot. I get all my analytics in one spot, my logging, my telemetry on the one location, right? Um, and then, um, you know, again, deploying this to this cloud firewall, right? So when your firewall is on-premises, you're very close to it, right? Almost no latency, you hit it, and then you probably do this load balancing thing that's not optimal out to the internet, but um, you know, at least you have uh, some redundancy there. Well, in SaaS, when you're on cloud firewall, it's very important that I make that firewall as close to you as possible, right? To give you a good experience, right? So there's always this notion of a, a, a sassy pop, right? A sassy point of presence. Um, and these pops do two things for you, right? They give you bandwidth, they give you an on-ramp into the cloud firewall infrastructure, but they also do compute because in SASE, we don't do things at the edge anymore, right? This cloud firewall, we do all that compute in these kind of central nodes. So uh, as you can see, not a ton change in this diagram visually, but uh, in actuality, a lot did, right? Now at the edge, no longer do I have these firewalls, right? Um, in terms of, you know, hey, you have a bunch of sort of gates or it's not calls or watch cards or whatever I've kind of sprinkled out to have the environment, right? Um, these are going to be uh, generally SASE appliances that are, are very lean because I'm not doing all out there. And what they do is they do enable 
that you know SD-WAN, the active active uh, link steering application recognition, making sure that you know Windows Update doesn't step on top of Zoom and, and vice versa, right? Um, but most importantly, it gets me to the closest SASE pop, right? So again, if I'm geographically diverse, if I'm East Coast, West Coast, whatever, um, I'm always going to enter the, the the closest you know um, point of presence for us. And then um, on the branch, right? The branch we used to just connect together. When we connect together, again, just as bad as VLAN one is, we're one big happy family, right? Um, lateral movement can become uh, a real challenge to stop, and this is even more so on MPLS or ENS or you know any private layer two, layer three. So in the SASE environment, right? I Again, go to my closest pop, again, assuming you're geographically diverse. Um, and now all my security is up there. And by security, I mean uh, next gen or you know, uh, cloud security, right? It's my next gen firewall, it's my IPS, it's my DNS, it's TLS decryption, which is something generally very hard to do on-prem just due to the pure horsepower of it. However, when kind of this elastic compute, I can do that now. Um, again, my anti phishing my, my botnet and, and all this, right? So. Now my site to safe traffic becomes robust, hitting the closest pop, going through my security stack, traversing private infrastructure between my pops, right? No longer I have to go through the, the peering relationships um, on the internet and then back down, right? So I've added a ton of resiliency, ton of redundancy, added a whole mess of security, and I've really blurred the lines of security and connectivity, right? Yeah, in the MPLS, there's nothing baked in and the layer two and, um, even site to site VPN, always your sites are trusted, right? All the land sites. So there's typically no security boundary, even when I do a site to site VPN, right? And uh, you'll see I added an edge up in my in my public cloud or again, my private cloud. Um, if you have a private vSphere, you get from a colo or whatever um, to where the management of that also rolls in, right? So now I get the full visibility. Um, and again, if anyone wants to, you know, connect to uh, my uh, VMs in Azure, right? Again, I multipath up, private connectivity, you know, hit the the, the public cloud, right? So um, again, with all those security trolls in the mix. And then we got my my end users over here, right? Um, again, they have a company issued device, and hopefully they still have the EDR client or whatever that looks like. Except now, close that split tunnel. We do a full tunnel. Two, you guys probably guessed it, closest pop, right? So again, if they're geogra geographically um, diverse, we're gonna hit the closest pop. Again, oftentimes they're probably mostly consuming SaaS application. So again, I can traverse private infrastructure and egress out the, the correct pop. Um, it's amazing here living on the West Coast, how much stuff is still hosting in Ashburn, Virginia, right? It'd be great if I could enter private infrastructure, go across uh, or enter a pop here in Portland, private infrastructure spit me out in, in Ashburn. So I don't go through again, all those peering relationships. Um, so most of our traffic doesn't even hit me anymore, right? I don't care about the, the trombone or um, the, the, the hairpin, right? But if they want accessing on-prem, right? They still go through the full security stack. And because they do that, right? We can do that, zero trust network access. Thank you, Gartner, for another bunch of acronyms there. Um, you know, I can put full security controls, right? Yes, you do authentication today, Hopefully it's MFA, right, or 2FA or whatever you have. Um, but now I can actually take identity into account. I can um, sync with Active Directory. I can also take device posture into account, right? Is my AV running? Are they in the United States? Are they coming from a Tor exit node? Right, all these things are just kind of uh, traditional uh, VPN doesn't really allow. Um, I guess I didn't touch on it before, but I mean, this also highlights that, right? When they just VPN into my infrastructure, I'm basically dragging a Cat5 cable out to their house for all intents and purposes, right? To where now I'm putting a, uh, a full uh, security stack in the mix. So um, we just see this, you know, making life a lot easier for everybody, right? Uh, Collapse in all of my security, all my orchestration, takes care of my end users, improves connectivity, um, zero trust, um, and beyond all that, SASE does allow us things like I mentioned, TLS decryption, right? Um, that just takes a lot of horsepower. If you have a traditional firewall, you know, that, that's a big boy, right? Depending, you know, if you need to do, you know, 500 meg or, or gigabit speed. There's also things that on-prem security appliances just cannot do, right? Things like our cloud access security broker, right? Um, that's kind of firewalling the SaaS applications, right? So, hey, you know, you can access my service now, but only certain parts of it or, or whatever that looks like. Um, or, hey, you can only download from Dropbox or not upload, right? So CASB, that's something you're not going to find on-prem. Um, DOP, right? I think uh, Kyle mentioned that data leak, data loss prevention. Again, that takes a lot of horsepower because it has to be done in conjunction with TLS decryption. 
I can't see the payload. I can't scan it for credit card numbers, PII, HIP information, intellectual property, right? So um, because I need TLS encryption and I need to be able to you know, read the entire payload, right? Um, again, something you just can't do. Um, we're starting to see uh, remote browser isolation, right? Actually rendering the browser on their end and um, you know, kind of proxying down on the client. Again, something that these things you just cannot do on-prem. Um, I mean, there's a reason we're kind of seeing this march to the cloud for elasticity and, and um, simplicity. And uh, again, um, we're huge fans of SASE solutions for delivering all of those type of technologies.